Hello, everyone, and welcome. I hope you're having a great day, and thank you for taking some time away and joining us for our Security Boulevard webinar. Today's uh, discussion is going to be on COVID-19 conundrum, a deep dive into cloud threats, and it is uh, being run by our, uh, uh, put on by our host, uh, sponsor Palo Alto Networks. But before we get into our discussion uh, with uh, Nathan Quist and, and Jay Chen, I'm going to go through some uh, quick housekeeping activities uh, for us to uh, understand primarily to let you understand our big marker uh, platform and how you can use it today. So first, I need to let you know that this is being recorded for uh, future use. So it will be posted, the complete uh, webinar will be posted on securityboulevard.com. Uh, you will receive an email link uh, after this event of the uh, uh, location, but should you not get that because it uh, goes into a spam folder or, or the email uh, address is a little different than one you primarily use, you can still go to Security Boulevard and, and find it under our webinar sections. The other parts uh, for our platform here is that we have a chat section, uh, a public chat, and uh, you know we use that to communicate amongst ourselves to let you know uh, where we're uh, located. So I'm in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts. So typing that in there. Hello. So if you'd like, you can put down where you're from or a little other comment uh, about uh, uh, what you're doing today, and we can have some, some dis discussion. There's also a Q&A tab there, so if you, after uh, uh, you have a question that uh, you'd like answered from our uh, presenters today, just put it in there, and if we have time, we will go through some of them. There's also a, uh, a handout section so the presentation will be available there and the threat report that is going to be uh, the topic of the discussion today is also available there. Uh, lastly, we will be handing out four $25 Amazon gift cards to the uh, attendees. So stay around till the end of this session where I will be announcing uh, those winners. So again, we are talking about uh, the uh, threat report report, the cloud threat report from uh, Palo Alto Networks Unit 42. And with us today, we have Nathaniel Quist, who's a senior threat researcher, and Jay Chen, also a senior threat researcher. Uh, they both are, are doing some cloud threats. So we're going to jump right into today's session. So take it away, uh, Nathaniel and Jay. Awesome. Thank you so much, Charles. Appreciate it. Um, I'll start off with the intro. Um, hello, my name is Nathaniel Quist. Um, I go by the letter Q, um, very straightforward, first letter of my last name. Uh, I'm a threat researcher with uh, Palo Alto Networks, specifically Prisma Cloud, which is the cloud portion of Palo Alto Networks, and Unit 42, which is the uh, threat intel section of uh, Palo Alto Networks. Hi, my name is Jay. Similar to Q, I work for Prisma Cloud and Unit 42. And my research has been around cloud native technology and any threats in the public in public clouds. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so uh, Jay mentioned his interest being uh, primarily the cloud focus. Um, he's done some really amazing work in uh, um, containerized uh, you know, exploits and things of that nature, so Kubernetes and Docker and things. Uh, my focus has been a little bit uh, different variant going in that. Um, I'm looking at who is attacking uh, um, the cloud infrastructure, like where they're coming from, kind of their, their TTPs, tech, tactics, techniques, and procedures they use, uh, and uh, um, what it is that, the, that they're trying to target. So. So yeah, um, I guess within uh, this this uh, conversation, um, we're going to be talking primarily about uh, the cloud threat report. Um, this is a, uh, a cloud threat report is something that Jay and I, um, our team puts out on a, a six month basis. We put two out a year. Um, this latest one that we're talking about is, uh, that we've just published on April 6th 
um, is specifically about uh, COVID-19, uh, the effect that COVID-19 had upon our industry, um, all industries really, but uh, we're looking at it specifically from a security bent. Um, you know, what happened, uh, you know, with COVID-19, how did the cloud change? How did the cloud uh, alter? Um, you know, how we, we uh, addressed some of the situations we had with COVID-19, and then what are the security implications that we had from that? Um, so uh, it's a fun conversation. If you want to go uh, take a look at this report, um, you can go to cloudthreat.report backslash 1H21, uh, and then you can uh, download the report uh, from our, uh, from our uh, websites. Awesome. Yes. yes. Yeah. A little bit. A little bit background about this. Uh, this research is this is a like highly data driven type of research. So we, in order to get the result that we are going to present in the next uh, in, in in the next forty minutes, we look into over forty thousand different cloud accounts across four leading major uh, four leading cloud service providers. And the owner of this cloud account that we look into belong to uh, owners across all different type of industries and all over the world. And we think each cloud account that we look into, we examine the security posture of all the workload pre and after, pre and post the uh, pandemic. Like, oh, we start to, the timeline, the, the time frame of our data started from late 2019 and ended in early 2000, uh, 2021. So in this way, we were trying to look at what is the impact, uh, what is how the COVID-19, how the pandemic impact the uh, usage of public cloud. One thing that, that uh, we're kind of proud about with this particular report is that uh, this is not survey data. This is actual this is actual real data um, from real clear uh, cloud environments that are experiencing real cloud uh, production uh, workflow. Um, we looked at the incidents that those particular uh, cloud um, environments have. What are some of the security risks that they have or misconfigurations they may have? Uh, and we generated our reports from that. So I think that uh, in, and of, in and of itself is a very um, specific um, you know, departure from a lot of other cloud threat reports that are out there. Just to pat our own backs and toot our own horns, you know, but uh, um, it's pretty, uh, um, very proud of this report. It's, it's pretty impressive. All right, so, um, so with that, um, Jay, I mean, you talked a little bit about the, the me methodology that we had uh, in, this, uh, in this report. Um, you know, um, are there like a specific types of, of highlights um, from this report that, that you found is kind of really interesting prior to um, um, us? Um, or what, you know, what's the biggest finding that you found from this report that you just think is the most interesting? Sure, yeah, there, there are a lot of interesting findings. Uh, I don't know, like, uh, can I advance the slide from my end? Oh yeah, sure, I think so. There you go. So impact on cloud workload by region. So before we even started this research, we have like heard a lot, of, heard from a lot of media and different reports that the cloud usage has been significantly increased because of the pandemic. Because people people are moving from the office to back to their home. Like within just few, uh, I think within just three months, the percentage of people working from uh, working from home increased from I think around twenty percent to seventy percent. And so we knew that we, we before we even look into our data, we sort of expected, hey, we will see uh, uh, an increase of cloud usage. But by how much, we don't know. That's what we wanted to find out. So well, after we started, after we digging into the data, yeah, that's that's exactly what we found out. We found that 25, like around 22% of the uh, organized, uh, Actually, 60 in this data, around 63% of the organization globally increased their cloud workload uh, during during, uh, during the second quarter of 2020. It's around March and April, and that's not surprising. Like 63% of the organization have their cloud usage increased. What really is 
surprise us. Another result that uh, was really shocking is that the increase of cloud workload actually lead to a big jump of cloud security incidents, which is the number I think in the next two slides. Uh, it, uh, so uh, this amount of increase of cloud workload actually lead to 188% increase of the sec uh, cloud security incident, incident pre and post COVID. That's something really shocking and unexpected to us. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, um, just to kind of reiterate that in slightly different terminology for, for some, um, it's just uh, we saw an increase in cloud workloads. And then with that increase of new, like well, say, cloud infrastructure, we saw a very dramatic all increase of um, security incidents uh, relating or coming from those particular uh, workloads themselves. So. Um, if we go back, if we if we take ourselves back to March 2020, uh, when um, you know the the CDC and the WHO said now we have a pandemic, uh, everybody should no longer uh, be close to everybody. We no need to do social distancing. Um, you know, companies and organizations and industries, entire industries. Um, shifted to work from home and they did that within a week so you can imagine how much infrastructure and uh cloud was was used to to facilitate um that shifting from in-person office work to remote work it's just it's mind-boggling so when you're truncating time down to um, a very small uh, portion and you're also increasing infrastructure dramatically there's going to be a rub something's going to fall apart and unfortunately our data shows that that was uh, security and security configuration. So um, it's just uh, it's pretty dramatic, but it's it's interesting to, that uh, that happened. You know, <laughs> why like why do you think? Can you like just just uh, just guess why why do you think this happened? Like, why do you think that is there any particular reason that you can guess why the number of security incidents increased like? disproportionate to the cloud workload. Do you want me to guess? Yeah. <laughs> Why did it? Um, I think that uh, um, um, so much infrastructure is so fast and you have to scale it out um, horizontally, right? You have to build a service that is able to with, withstand all this information, all this request coming into it, that you have to build it so quickly that um, you need to build something that can scale quickly. Um, but if if uh, um, you are fast and you are in a hurry to make that thing, you're going to probably miss something because most of us are doing that human wise. We're doing it manually um, as opposed to probably a programmatic function that uh, the, that would be more more uh, beneficial. That's my guess. I I agree. Yeah, that's uh, what I feel as well. It's like. Like uh, the scale of today's cloud workload is simply not uh, manageable if you do everything by hand. Like I used to set up my my cloud environment by clicking clicking through buttons in Web Console, but when managing thousands of virtual machine comp containers or database, this is simply not uh, scalable. This is like manual work is. It's just not a cloud native way to manage your cloud environment. And human humans are always the weakest link. Human mis mistake, and these mistakes usually lead to uh, security incidents in the cloud in, in cloud environment. Yeah, awesome. Um, so before we start going a little bit farther into security, because we we are going to talk more about security and specific incidences and things like that. So um, Jay, if we're gonna let's go to the next slide here. All right. Um, so within this, like, can you talk us through why um, we're, we broke down um, our, our findings based upon industry and what were some of those kind of fun findings we found? Yeah, yeah. So like we mentioned that uh, pandemic hit every industry, right? And some in some 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 industries are hit harder than others. Like, for example, chemical in our in, in our research. We found that chemical, government, and pharmaceutical are the three industries that had the largest number, uh, the largest increase in their cloud workload. And it sort of, it, it makes sense, uh, right? Because chemical industry, industry 
they rush to doing research in the vaccine testing kit or or or, or uh, uh, any kind of related uh, sanitization products and government they are busy in in managing the policy creating regulation and policy and, and take care of the uh, citizens so they have they had a very very uh, large increase in cloud workload as well did we see a, a correlation between um, uh, these chemical government and pharma? Did we see a correlation between um, you know these, these? They grew significantly, eighty some some percent, uh, as far as their cloud workload uh, is is happening. Um, did we see a correlation between this growing workload and also security incidences within that same um, those same industries? We do, yeah. So uh, I think we uh, in our uh, next slide, we will see that these three industries also had a uh, very high increase in security incidents, although they are not the, the, the top three in terms of security incidents, but uh, which is good news, actually, like we, we can see from like government uh, if you look at the previous slide, government had about 83% of increase in their cloud work, uh, workload, which lead to, uh, I think, around 200 uh, increase in their cloud security incidents. This ratio is actually better than the net, uh, like world global average. And in other industries, such as, uh, uh, I don't, it's probably not showing, in this figure, in other industries such as financial, banking, and insurance, although they also although they had a large amount of growth in cloud workload, their number their number of increased security incidents uh, were much uh, better than others, which also is the good news. Could you speculate at all as to why that may I, be? I think yeah. So the 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 so industries such as banking, financial, and in, uh, insurance they had st more strict policies and compliance to follow, which def definitely helped them in, uh, in secure their cloud uh, cloud workload and their cloud environment and when situation required them to quickly increase their cloud workload, those uh, regulation does help them stay in the guardrail. Hey, Jay, can you hear me? This is uh, Charles. Yes. Yeah, I just want to jump in here because that that first button, that retail, which is, you know, is an outlier, right? Over 400% increase. And I know that they had a lot of, you know, during the pandemic, we had a lot of business email compromise, but I don't think that falls under this cloud security area. So there's two things. One, they grew so much because they weren't attacked as much before, right? So right, right, they were right. growing from a, a, a much smaller incidence. But is there any specific, you know, is this a supply chain thing because, you know, we had shortages or... Is it just because they were the only people open at some time, you know, especially grocery stores and, and things? So I'm kind of curious because it's a real outlier in terms of, you know, the growth. It, it's just off the charts for even, you know, you kind of expect the manufacturing and government and pharmaceuticals who grew their uh, cloud usage, but retail wasn't even on that chart. And now their the attacks were, uh, are, you know, so far, so far ahead. So I'm kind of curious if you have any any insight on that. Sure, I think uh, just to clarify the uh, the security incidents we saw in this uh, cloud environments are not uh, equivalent equivalent to attacks. They are not attacks. We didn't see the real attacks to this. Uh, uh, this cloud environment, the security incidents we mean we mean here are just the uh, 
misconfig mostly are just misconfigurations that we observed in the environment. And that's inter it, you, you mentioned a good point that it is very interesting to see that retail stand out. They had the large uh, percentage of in, uh, the, the largest percentage of increase in uh, security uh, security incidents. And I, I I I don't know exactly why, but in they did like uh, retail they do have a. A large jump in terms, large increase in terms of of their cloud workload. Like we, I know, like at least for me, during the pandemic, we everybody like I, I had trouble to get even the paper tower or, or or toilet paper, like all kind of consuming like daily necessities that this retailer provide are in great shortage, and I can imagine they rush to increase their. Uh, IT infrastructure to support such increase in turn uh, of demand. And yeah, as, yeah. That, yeah, as you explained that it's a lot of misconfigurations and, and uh, security uh, issues, uh, not so much attacks, that does make a lot of sense because as you right. said, retail, retail had to really jump into this to, to stay active and, and uh, you know, they went and did all of the online ordering and and things. So yeah, it makes a lot of sense uh, that they would have this amount of of uh, increase. Yeah, yeah. And I guess, yeah. So sorry, go ahead. No, no. I I don't want to derail us too much um, or anything like that. But um, some of our past research that we've done, um, you know, Jay and I, we've looked specifically at um, you know. Uh, what are the vulnerability, common vulnerabilities within our environment? What are some of those misconfigurations that are most commonly expected uh, in our environment? And what we're finding within cloud, uh, just kind of in general, at least it has been, um, you know, about a year ago or so, up to now, is that 65% um, of most of the security problems within cloud environments um, are due to misconfigurations. It has really nothing to do with um, you know, like zero day attacks or, uh, you know, like bad security instance or something like that, but it's just like a misconfiguration, uh, forgot to close a port or forgot to, um, you know, turn logging on or forgot to, you know, do a lot of things like that. That's just very basic things that ultimately trickles out uh, into the cloud. Um, and then when you combine that, you combine that sort of one off sort of uh, missing security element. Um, and then you bring that into the cloud environment where we have rapid scaling or horizontal scaling of, of cloud resources. Um, you're using something like uh, Terraform or you know cl cloud formation or something to to automatically build or dynamically build uh, um, you know programmatically wise within your cloud environment um, that that one misconfiguration is is populated or propagated across you know hundreds if not thousands of different uh, cloud, uh, environments with that one organization may may control. So you might have one instance or one mitigation, one misconfiguration that instantly gets spread across, um, you know, larger cloud environments. It's pretty impressive, pretty interesting. Um, I want to take this opportunity to kind of go to the next slide here. And this next slide um, is, is kind of interesting. Um, and, and I know, Jay, you, you kind of looked through it, but I find this interesting because out of, uh, this is the top, I think, 15, of, of what are the, the most common security incidents that we found um, within, uh, you know, during this, this report. Um, and it's kind of broken off into three primary, primary groups. Uh, one is encrypted data, another one is exposed services, and another one is, is disabled logging. Uh, we've hammered on these um, for about, uh, you know, two years since we really started these uh, cloud threat reports. Um, but uh, um, Jay, is there one thing that, that kind of stood out with here that, that you thought was was more interesting than others? What was something that you just kind of like, um, you know, was, was more shocking, I guess? Uh, not really shocking. Like we actually did a similar analysis uh, in another report, I think, uh, I think 18 months ago. And what interest, what, stand, what really stood out to me is that people are making the same mistake. Like, all the time. So for what actually show on this figure is that the top 15 security incidents that we saw, uh, 
during the early stage of the pandemic, I, I think from uh, between March 2020 to September 2020. And these are the top 15 security incidents that we saw just uh, happen during that period. And these figures or these uh, three categories and this set of misconfigurations misconfigura are not strangers to us. We saw this in our uh, previous report. Like over time, people made the same uh, same misconfiguration before or after COVID, like during any kind of situation. But when you are in a rush, this type of mis misconfiguration is sort of amplified. Like instead of making one mistake every day, you may make three mistakes in, in a single day because of the pressure from 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 from, from your manager. Yeah, definitely. I think that I think that's a really good point. Um, you know, and especially when you're, you know, if you use something like infrastructure as code or Terraform, like I've said, cloud formation, that one mistake just gets, you know, um, pulled out more and more. Um, there's a couple of questions um, that I that I do want to get to. Uh, Maria um, asks, uh, looking at banking and retail numbers, are the numbers caused by the fact? Uh, that banks rarely uh, go to, or go to cloud due to regulatory requirements. Um, I don't know if I can uh, necessarily answer this question because I don't know um, a lot of the banking uh, requirements. Um, I do know um, that uh, banking and finance and uh, insurance did see uh, an increase in cloud workloads. Um, it, it, you know, there was there was only one industry that we saw that actually had a negative. Um, um, cloud work or cloud workload during this time, and that was oil and gas uh, as an industry. Um, so banking and insurance did see an increase in cloud workloads, um, and they did sh uh, show a, uh, um, a relative increase in security incidents. Um, if you go, if we go back to this previous slide here, slide six, um, you can see like right in the middle, you see banking there, uh, and then um, uh, a little bit lower, uh, right underneath it, you see insurance, and we saw 44 uh, percent increase. Uh, and security incidents for insurance and 53% increase uh, in banking. Um, so there are some um, security incidents uh, that, that were increased. Um, I can't necessarily address um, the regulatory requirements for banking um, or where these particular instances, where they were located within that banking infrastructure. That was just, that's too granular for, for us to see, unfortunately. Um, looking back at this uh, cloud security by industry, or I'm sorry, um, we're gonna proceed back to uh, the slide we were just on. Um, some things that I really uh, like to, to look at um, within this environment are, are exposed services. Uh, it's something that, I, that I, I find very fascinating with what the, the types of exposed services that, that we're seeing within cloud infrastructure. Um, some of them are kind of um, you know, interesting or surprising to me, like 70% um, uh, of organizations uh, saw an, uh, an exposure of Telnet or port 23 traffic. Um, you know, 62% uh, of organizations saw a exposure of uh, SMB or port 445, 61% saw an exposure of port 20, uh, which is uh, uh, basically FTP, um, file transfer protocols. Um, and then an interesting one that I always, I always harp on all the time is RDP um, and uh, remote desktop protocol for specifically, generally for Windows environments, although you can do it uh, in Linux and Unix environments as well. Um, but we saw about 59% of global industries exposing um, RDP uh, to the public. And to me, that's just like, it's a very surprising and very, um, you know, interesting uh, dynamic um, that, that we're seeing. Uh, in that yeah, and just help everyone, everyone understand why these are, why these are security incidents, why these are bad. Like, these are the services that you should never expose to the entire internet. Uh, Telnet. I don't know who is still using Telnet and <laughs> Telnet. And, and 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 like port FTP as, as well. Like I don't know who is still using FTP, but apparently people are not people used FTP twenty years ago on print, but today with cloud they are still using FTP and they are making the same insecure configuration. So yeah, I don't know what to say. Yeah, it's. 
It's interesting. I mean, um, some in some aspects, I mean, living within the, the cloud world, um, sometimes it feels from a security perspective, like we're back in, you know, late 1990. And it's just kind of like, oh, oh, my gosh, now let's let's go tell that to somebody's network and, you know, <laughs> exfil all the data. Um, but it's just a, it's, it's kind of funny that we're seeing some of these patterns uh, repeat um, back in our, our cloud environment. Um, and these are things that. Um, you know, simple scanning or vulnerability scanning, you know, uh, configuration scanning um, can take care of and eliminate for you. You don't have to worry about these exposures. Hi, this, this is Charles again. And uh, uh, given my, I, I consider myself the encryption analyst uh, in, in many ways. And, you know, unencrypted data right there, two, one and one and three. So I'm kind of curious where it says that, SQL uh, databases have encryption disabled. So does that mean that it had, that it was enabled and it, or it can be existing and then it is disabled or is it just not, it's not enabled? Uh, in this particular instance, it was not enabled. Um, SQL is uh, SQL databases or um, database snapshots, which you can do in cloud environments as well. Um, they're just not being encrypted. Uh, in, in any way. And it's interesting as well because um, this is a feature that uh, encryption being like a, a feature that is free in every cloud service provider. So whether you're on uh, AWS or uh, Google Cloud Platform or Azure or Alibaba or DigitalOcean or, you know, all the, all the ones that you could be on, IBM, Oracle, um, they all provide encryption. And seeing um, new services, especially SQL databases uh, or any kind of, um, you know, Postgres, whatever kind of uh, uh, database you're using not being encrypted, um, you know, it, it's a concern and something that, that definitely needs to be addressed for sure. Yeah, yeah, because the, the great the great part, the, the issue is, you know, the encryption can be a, a, a backup sort of to something else, right? So if you have a credential issue, but the database is encrypted, you know, somebody grabs the database and it's encrypted, that they're not going to be able to, to get to it. So it really is a great you know, second, we want to call it a second factor or something for the cloud security. And, and it's just amazing that uh, it's there. And I'm sure it's, you know, as I always talk about it, it has a lot to do with fear. You know, people don't want to enable encryption because they're always afraid that if it doesn't work, I'm, I'm out, right? Or sure. if I lose the password or forget. Uh, uh, so it's, so, you know, for many, it's safer, it's safer for them, they feel to leave it unencrypted, even though it creates this huge uh, potential vulnerability. Security hole. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's another question from Michael. It fits right into this uh, kind of environment. Um, so thanks, Michael, for the question. Um, uh, so exposed services. So what would be the mitigation? Uh, aside from not using said service, it seems like VPN might work. But uh, don't we encounter many problems when switching everyone in a business to the VPN? Um, I have my own thoughts on this uh, as well, but but safe to and, and Jay, I'd like to hear your thoughts. Do you have um, what is a mitigation uh, for um, exposed services? Um, what is probably the biggest thing that we could do to to stop these things? Firewall, like you simply just don't expose this service to the entire network. Like for example, for a database service, like for a MySQL service running on um, uh, like port, I forget the port, but for your SQL, for example, if you have a MySQL service, this MySQL database is usually only accessed by a few applications, like a few backend application servers, and only expose the MySQL server to those services in your cloud environment, but not expose it to the entire internet so that everyone else can, can access it directly. It should never be accessed by anyone other than uh, your application server and similar yeah. to other service. 33, 33 like um, uh, RTP service, you should only only expose to a very small amount of IP, you know where you will uh, initiate the connection. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point. So if these security incidents, these exposed services, um, these are not just sort of exposed, these are publicly wide open, like flapping in the wind sort of sort of aspect. Um, and so so just putting some guardrail around um, these services, databases just being exposed publicly, 
never a good idea, especially when they're not encrypted on top of that. Um, but, you know, like narrowing it, like Jay said, to a very specific incidence is typically if you have a web server that is sort of remotely exposed uh, to, to the World Wide Web, it's typically for a web page or a, a site or something like that. And that is, you know, guarded or, you know, you know, the, the point of entry, the bottleneck for that operation is going to be that Nginx or that Apache server or something of that nature. And that is the only thing that should communicate with that back end database. Um, so just limiting it to that one server uh, service that needs to be uh, run is a, is a great, um, um, the best idea. Um, um, RDP specifically, um, RDP is for remote um, administration of a server. Uh, so you don't need that, you know, everybody in the world doesn't need to, to remotely ad, uh, administer your server uh, in your environment or in your cloud. Um, so, so narrowing it down to just those specific, you know, IAM roles or those specific users that will use that particular service. Um, you know, that's, that's all that, that's, that's whoever should, should be able to use it. Or if you wanted to use something like a jump host or a bastion host or something like that, um, that, that is the only system that will ever access uh, these cloud services. Um, then, you know, limit it and narrow it, narrow that scope. Um, since we're harping on RDP, I'm gonna go to the next slide just real fast. Well, we looked at uh, uh, by country um, and, and we looked at RDP exposure and which countries are doing better than others. Um, Canada, unfortunately, I'm sorry, our, our, uh, our family members to the north, um, you know, 70% of organizations in Canada are exposing RDP. Uh, publicly. Um, we're on the flip side, Japan, 38% um, of organizations uh, are exposing um, um, RDP publicly. Uh, so there is, there's a different, you know, some countries are, are, are you know, there's, there's different levels uh, within that. I can't tell you exactly why. Um, Canada, maybe Canada is more trusting, you know, than, <laughs> than uh, Japan. I'm not sure. Um, but, uh, but, you know, there's some interesting uh, nuance there. But I don't want to hammer on that too much. Um, but uh, any Jay, you want to, anything you want to say about that? No, all right. We're gonna um, go to the next one here. Um, Jay, this is kind of more your data. Uh, this GIF didn't work, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, this is a, a, a GIF. I'll just walk everybody through it. This little kid—I don't know if you've seen it before—taking um, a, a shovel of dirt, throwing it in the air, and it just all lands in his face. Um, and it's just—it's like no, you know—it's like shooting yourself in the foot. Uh, when we see that 30% of organizations uh, are exposing sensitive data publicly. Um, Jay, this is kind of your wheelhouse. You did all the research on this. Um, kind of lead us through this. Just a little, uh, just a few most important findings here. So we went to think billions of data objects stored in cloud. And we use our DLP module to classify uh, this file stored in the cloud. And we found that uh, 60, around 60% 60 uh, of this, of the data stored in the cloud environment contains sensitive information. And this overall, over, Overall, around 60% of the data in the cloud environment contains sensitive, sensitive information such as PII, intellectual property, or healthcare. And among all the cloud accounts that we look at, we noticed that 30% of the organization most likely inadvertently or unintentionally expose some of the uh, sensitive data to the internet, like make them public. This data, like, I don't think they intentionally uh, make them public, but just like imagine the amount of data that we generate nowadays, there are just too many data. And if you have one bucket that can usually contain non-sensitive data for web application, but one day another engineer may just inadvertently drop in some data contain the, your customer customer information, and those customer information immediately become public. Although, like you don't announce to the internet that, that hey we have uh, we have some sensitive data here, but there are 
internet scanners running all the time. They try to identify those this type of misconfigure uh, cloud storage and as long as they can guess the right as long as as long as they can find out the URL to your cloud storage, they can access it without password or authentication. And yeah, that's uh, one of the most uh, scary part. I think 30% uh, of the organizations expose some sensitive data to public. And the next one, the ne this figure is basically, as I mentioned, Amongst among sixty percent of the data in the cloud that contains sensitive information, uh, around seventy percent seventy percent of them are PII personal identified uh, identifiable information, and around 40, 40, uh, 33 percent of them contain uh, intellectual property. So, yeah, it's uh, and I just want to mention that. We, I did another research just to just try to identify this kind of uh, uh, publicly exposed sensitive data in the cloud. There are multiple ways that you can find out uh, this uh, exposed uh, publicly exposed data. So one of the easiest way is to scrap GitHub from the Git. Just just looking into GitHub, you can see a lot of uh, uh, URL to AWS S3 bucket or Azure block or, 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 or uh, GCP data store. So that's one of the easiest way. And you can also scrape a lot of website which they use, which they use cloud storage to serve their files. And by scraping, by, by scraping their uh, JavaScript file, you can also find a lot of URLs linking back to their cloud storage. And by doing reverse engineering um, uh, mobile applications, again, you can also find a lot of uh, links to cloud storage. And so, yeah, you can, there are uh, researchers or malicious actors actively looking for this kind of uh, leak data every day. All right. Um, Chris, yeah, thank you for your question. Um, what are we referring to uh, when it comes to uh, sensitive data? Um, I think that this slide, uh, we're looking specifically at PII, so there are a number of uh, things that, that uh, can resemble PII. Those are, you know, uh, names, passwords, uh, well, that's not so much PII, but, uh, you know, IP addresses, uh, you know, addresses, you know, physical addresses, lots of things can be uh, PII. Um, intellectual property, that being like a, a source code material, uh, things of that nature. Um, healthcare data, and I think financial data are pretty, pretty general, so credit card informations, um, you know, uh, healthcare data, like which hospitals people go to, um, things of that nature. Um, and again, like Jay said, there's a lot of uh, links to, to find this just within a, a nice Google query or, or a GitHub scrape. So um, uh, unfortunately, I hope that answers your question. Um, so yeah, Jay. Anything else when it comes to uh, uh, sensitive data or or any uh, more classifications of sensitive data? Uh, no, I think we have had enough about data. We can go to our next slide. <laughs> so I, right I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say, Jay, you don't have enough on on this ship right now. So has it changed? Did this change during the pandemic? Because we've always had issues of people exposing data is this is this relatively the same or or are you did you see a lot more uh, sensitive data uh, available in this so way? unfortunately we don't have the data we don't for this particular uh, statistic we don't have the data during the pandemic yeah we only have this data in the past six uh, three like, I think five months. So I, I, I cannot tell you what happened during the pandemic, the peak of the pandemic. Okay. All right. It, you know, I, again, it, I, I am in some ways kind of feel semi good. I don't know, semi good that healthcare and financial data, which are both uh, highly regulated, do show up a lot less there. So 
that that's kind of a good sign. Sometimes the negative number is a is a good number, and and I think in this case it is. Agree. Yeah, hundred totally percent agree. agree. Very much so. I'm happy about that as well. Um, all right, so uh, with that, we have uh, um, really about 16 so minutes left, and I would like to leave some time for questions. We have one more section uh, that we want to go, uh, uh, want to go over, um, and this section is primarily around uh, cryptocurrency, um, things of that nature. We did folks spend a little bit of time uh, looking at that within uh, this, re this particular report, and we always devote some portion of our uh, cloud threat report to some sort of crypto mining operation or something of that nature. Um, so. With that, um, we actually have some good news uh, during this this time where we have actually seen the very first decrease uh, in organizations communicating with known crypto mining uh, mining pools. Uh, back in uh, October of last year, uh, 2020, uh, we reported that 23% of organizations um, are, are experiencing some sort of cryptocurrency, crypto mining operation within their cloud environments. Uh, and then in, uh, we just reported uh, in April this year, that, uh, that that's down to 17. And this marks the very first time we have ever seen uh, a decrease in the number of cloud organizations um, performing crypto mining operations. And this was since uh, you know early 2018 when we first kind of started tracking this uh, particular metric. It was just going up and up and up. And now we're starting to see, uh, first see that very first uh, decline. So you know, good ooh yeah sort of gif on that one. It's pretty awesome. I'm, I'm happy to see, to see that. Um, and uh, there is a kind of a side uh, movement with this, um, is that uh, um, although we're seeing a decrease in the total uh, number of cloud organizations that are experiencing that, we actually saw an, an overall increase, a 65% increase in the total volume of crypto mining uh, traffic that was happening. Um, so you might be like, well, well, you just said it was a decrease. Why are we increasing uh, right now? So um, some of that is why we're seeing that decrease is that organizations, cloud organizations, are, are finally becoming aware of crypto mining being a threat uh, in cloud uh, environments. It's not necessarily about you know using compute cycles or spending in a little extra money. There's a lot of extra stuff that a, that a, a crypto mining operation can have in an environment um, that is over and above just using CPUs or, or something of that. Um, so organizations are starting to see that and starting to close off uh, their cloud environments from these type of things. But cloud operations, cloud those, those, those miners, those threat actors uh, that are performing these cloud operations um, are actually seeing that. They're like, oh no, I'm losing you know, a lot of my miners. What are we gonna do uh, with that? So what they're doing is they're turning up their, their mining operations. They're trying to suck probably a little bit more out of each individual miner or trying to uh, you know, exploit those environments that they have access to a little harder um, to make up, kind of recoup some of their losses. So, so that's the, the, the current latest trend that we're, that we're, that we're seeing and tracking right now. Um, just thought that that was a, a pretty interesting, interesting take. Yeah, no, um, the, the, the yeah, thing that that's a, uh, uh, just to quickly mention, it's kind of a good thing, right? It becomes a vicious cycle, right? If they ramp up and start using more resources and, and the, your cloud bill is going up, then you become more aware and you shut it down. So hopefully it's it becomes a death spiral, if we want to call it that, right? Sure. It's a possibility. I think it's something to watch in the future. Most certainly. Um, and we're starting to see, and there's actually evidence now, um, we've written a, a few blogs, just released a few things later, uh, just within the last uh, couple of months as well, specifically around uh, this kind of phenomenon and the actors that are doing it. Um, one of them is Watchdog, and Watchdog is a very interesting group in that um, they're they're seeing a decline in their, uh, their, their environment, but they've actually countered that by making more powerful exploitation systems. They actually have one one uh, mining software, one binary that they use is packed with 33 different exploits, uh, ranging from remote code executions to uh, encoded PowerShell commands to uh, to a lot of things like that. Um, and so they're they're ramping up um, their exploitation capabilities for cloud systems in counter to uh, cloud environments turning them off. Um, we also have other instances where there's a cloud group by the name of Team TNT 
And this group is actually uh, outright tweeting at you know both Jay and myself and Unit 42 uh, 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 in general that it's like, oh my gosh, they're taking down my latest botnets. You guys, you know, you're getting too fast for this. So it's kind of fun that uh, we have these actors that are um, starting to actually see the work that we're doing and then starting to point fingers at us and saying, oh, you guys are turning off my systems. Um, so it's it's kind of funny. <laughs> can you can you explain what kind of uh, misconfiguration or vulnerabilities that led to this kind of crypto jacking, crypto jacking in, in cloud environment? Yeah, great question. Thanks, Jay. Um, so um, a lot of the things, and, and it's it's evolved, it's changed a little bit in the past, but but routinely, um, it's it's the uh, uh, exposure of publicly available systems. So um, a big target there for a long time was Redis servers. Um, anytime you saw an exposed Redis server, there was exploits that just go out and attack that. Um, Oracle web logic systems, uh, very similar uh, in that they're just being exposed. Um, recently, there's been a lot of uh, scanning and scraping for uh, both Redis servers, yes, um, but also Docker API engines. Um, if you see a Docker engine, um, that's a container environment and the attackers will just uh, exploit that particular system and start spinning up a whole bunch of new containerized uh, malicious images or containers inside of that, that environment. Um, they're starting to focus on uh, Kubernetes systems as well. C uh, Kubernetes API uh, is uh, a, a hot topic. Team TNT, again, uh, Jay just published a blog uh, just again, I think month, about a month ago, that was completely focused on their uh, targeting of Kubernetes clusters uh, and specifically that Kubernetes API that they're, that they're targeting. Um, so again, exposed systems that are publicly you know, publicly exposed services um, being a, a number one target for that. So interesting, interesting comments there. So don't expose your service. Don't expose your services. So. <laughs> <laughs> Except if, unless you have to, but if you have to, then make sure that you're using the latest, greatest uh, um, versioning, uh, patching capabilities of those particular things. Just kind of like, you know, patching 101, right? Make sure that it's patched, make sure that it's updated um, before you start uh, um, deploying them publicly or in production. Um, another thing that I wanna to touch on here, we have a few minutes left, um, is uh, uh, Monero. Um, if you're not familiar, uh, Monero is a, uh, uh, a cryptocurrency. It is a, it is a coin that is publicly available uh, on a number of different uh, crypto mining or cryptocurrency exchanges. Um, not so much within US, so like Binance US or uh, you know Bittrex or, or Coinbase, something like that. Um, but but uh, Monero itself is um, currently the king when it comes to cloud uh, mining operations. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, one, malicious users really love it because of its uh, security um, focus uh, and how it runs. Um, that security focus being a relative sense of anonymity um, and a very large market presence. Uh, if you want to go to a marketplace, uh, and there's several of them uh, on the dark web, and you wanna buy literally anything illicit that you can think of, um, Monero is the coin that you would use to, to uh, purchase that said illicit material. Um, and it's secure. Uh, what makes it secure is that it has something called a ring signature, which means a number of people within a specific peer level um, can sign uh, for a transaction. And if you can have a lot of people signing for every transaction, you can't necessarily point at one person and say that that one person uh, made that particular transaction uh, uh, or, or, or purchase. Um, so there's plausible deniability uh, within that. Um, another thing that makes uh, Monero very interesting is something called a stealth address. Uh, you can kind of think of it a little bit like a P.O. box uh, in that you don't necessarily know the owner of a P.O. box or where it's physically located per se. Um, but uh, if you watch it long enough, you can find out who, who routinely goes to it. Um, but uh, what a stealth address does is for every transaction that happens uh, within Monero, um, a, a new address is given, a one-time use only address uh, that is not traceable or linkable to any addresses that may be using it. Um, so, so there's a lot of anonymity uh, when it comes to that. Uh, interesting enough, uh, when we say Monero is the king, because we looked at uh, Monero, we looked at Ethereum, we looked at Block, uh, Bitcoin, Litecash, and Dash, um, as far as their mining operations and where you would go to mine those particular currencies. Uh, we found that Monero had 99% of all of the cloud traffic uh, um, for mining pools in that operation. Ethereum was the next closest, 
Um, and, but it was just a fraction. I mean, less than uh, 0.8 of a percent of the total mining traffic. Uh, Bitcoin, like Cash and Dash, um, they all combined for less than 1% of the total traffic uh, involved. And there's a number of reasons for that. It's just not profitable uh, to mine Bitcoin or like Cash or Dash with a CPU. Um, you need to have special hardware uh, in order to make a profit on that. So uh, on the flip side of that, um, if you do see any mining operations at all going to known uh, Bitcoin mining mining pools or uh, or even Ethereum to a certain degree, um, you know, it's just there's no there's no financial sense doing that. So it's probably malicious uh, or at least highly suspect uh, to begin with. So if you see that, just go ahead and cut it off. So. All right, um, so uh, those are uh, um, everything that we had within our report. Um, I would definitely like to take questions if there are uh, further questions uh, uh, coming through. Um, and uh, yeah, let's see what we have available here. Um, so uh, a few questions here. So uh, um, does automation on certain processes or algorithms help mitigate cyber threats? Um, I, um, I think that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think we've kind of alluded to it uh, in some aspects. Um, um, automation of um, security mitigation measures, so like you know, using vulnerability scanning, using um, some sort of a cloud native security platform to monitor uh, the deployment of your production uh, uh, your production containers or an in, you know, uh, cloud instances as they're moving forward. Um, you know, automating that will certainly help mitigate a lot of threats uh, in your environment. Um, and I think that answers. Jay, do you have anything um, to add to that? I think yeah, that's that, that's a great answer. I think automation is so important in in today's uh, cloud environment or CI/CD any kind of pipeline because the the build process has become so complex that many of works just not scalable and, and 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 not there's no way that you can securely uh, make a hundred configuration without making any mistakes well there's, right. there's and and there's just one more question i think we can we have time for uh, before we we sign out and if you just uh, quickly say you know what is the, you know, most efficient way of, of uh, for admins to uh, prevent account compromise. Jay, do you want to take this one? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I think that uh, I think this is a there's no short answer for this question to protect your. Uh, uh, identity. So ident I am identity and asset management is a big topic. And there are, this is the, I mean, according to our research, IAM is one of the, is currently the biggest attack vector into cloud environment, like due to misconfiguration. Again, like uh, by scraping the GitHub, you can find out some, 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 some uh, access token there. And that access token may allow you to gain a specific uh, service in the cloud environment. And from that service, you can start to do some, like you can start to do lateral movement or, or privilege escalation. And eventually you may be able to get the uh, admin account. But uh, there are some basic way to protect uh, any kind of identities, you know, regardless in the cloud or not. First, like uh, minimize the usage of your root. Uh, your root, root root account in cloud. Most of the cloud, uh, most of the like all the cloud environment uh, cloud account have at least one root account, and that root you typically on your day to day works. Usually, you don't need that root uh, root account. Should, you should just put it in your drawer, lock it, never use it. Now, your for your day to day work, just use a lower privilege account uh, in case you. In, you lost control of this account. You you contain the the damage. You contain the the blaze radius. Okay. And the second, uh, yeah. 
So Jay, I got to cut you off because we need to, I got to get the uh, uh, winners of the $25. I want to thank uh, Nathaniel and Jay for uh, the event. Uh, for uh, if you want to get the report, it is available. The direct link to the handout is in the handout section. Uh, and uh, our winners for the $25 Amazon gift cards are uh, Roger H, Tina, uh, Trina J, Wayne L, and Bill B. And uh, for a quick answer for, for that last question is go to uh, Palo Alto's networks, uh, dot, uh, uh website, and I'm sure you can find information on how to protect your cloud uh, environment there. So with that, I thank everyone, and uh, we're going to sign off for today. Uh, have a good one.